Hey, welcome back everybody. One Night Sniper here. Okay, this is going to be a uh, another codec, Codex episode. Uh, I'm not actually sure which number it is. Six or seven, maybe. Okay, so this one's going to be just the old traditional style without any having any uh, multiplayer in the background. Basically because I edited myself into a corner here and I kind of have to record one. I don't have time to do multiplayer. So, um, alright, let's, uh, let's jump into this. I said we're going to start at the bottom this time. Uh, we'll start with ships and vehicles. Uh, looks like we've already read these, but I don't believe we have. Uh, actually, we must have. Maybe I did jump down here. Okay, so we're going to start off with the Tempest technology. Uh, the Tempest required a number of experimental technologies to accommodate the unique requirements of a Pathfinder team. Its planetary surface... Its planetary surface imaging, for example, uses photosensitive and radar-lidar emitting microsatellites that coordinate with the Tempest router back to SAMNode. I then conduct a simulated scientific and probability studies on the data before presenting the Pathfinder with a summarized analysis, typically in 0.5 seconds. The Tempest computer network presented interesting challenges. As mo mo most Milky Way computer systems have anti-AI safeguards built in, the Tempest network had to be designed from scratch to accommodate my interaction with the ship's systems. Firmware bridges inspired by studies into Geth networking technology allow me to temporarily interact with and augment sensors, communications, and the ship's navigation array. Given the desire to reduce mass, mass without sacrificing safety, the electrical charge from the Tempest capacitors is used to keep the ship stable. Via prototype piezoelectric vibration reduction, PVR technology, when the ship's superstructure is bent by vibrations, such as during atmospheric reentry or complex flight maneuvers, <laughs> piezoelectric elements receive an electrical charge that bends bulkheads in the opposite direction, reducing vibrations and smoothing the ship's flight path. To Tempest Research Capabilities Pathfinders are often the, f the first to encounter new potential threats of viable technology. The Tempest is therefore equipped for sophisticated research and development in the field to support a fast turnaround of any necessary upgrades or analysis. Its research center syncs with the tech lab systems, giving insight into the capabilities of new materials and their potential applications. My connection to Arc Hyperion and the Nexus allows me to transfer data and latest discoveries from the scientists stationed there. Quantum computing enables multiple complex simulations to be run simultaneously and new components or configurations can be tested virtually before they are built. Okay, the Stealth Systems. In 2183, the Systems Alliance and the Turian Hierarchy co-developed the IES, Internal Emission Sync, Stealth System for small military frigates. It's unknown how the initiative acquired this system for its survey ships, as IES stealth technology is classified. Despite valid security cert certifications, no record of negotiations exist in the Nexus legal archives. Okay. An IES stealth system is designed to capture the heat and radiation emitted by all starships in refrigerated storage sinks, effectively removing the ship from sensors. Initiative starship systems are streamlined to emit less electromagnetic and particle radiation, and to lower heat production. This reduces the amount of emissions to be stored. Additionally, breakthroughs in cryogenic research allow the storage tanks to be more effectively refrigerated, allowing longer stealth time before the sinks must be vented for safety. The Tempest can remain stationary in stealth for several hours or travel at FTL in silent running for shorter periods. Arc Natanis Arc Natanis was constructed in orbit around Aventon, a once lucrative mining planet in the Turium home system Trebia. The Arc was named after legendary spacefarer Palax Natanis, who is believed to be the first Turian to travel through a mass relay. The Natanis is built to similar specifications as the Sari and Human Arcs, but the minor changes in to accommodate her dextra amino acid based passengers. Natanis is captained by the renowned Dia Praton of the Sixth Fleet. Like most economic ventures, Turian investors were turned into the Andromeda Initiative, turned on to the Andromeda Initiative by their clients, the Volus. The Turian hierarchy was intentionally kept in the dark to keep the initiative a private civilian project. Arc Natanis traveled to the initiative rendezvous point in 2184 and left the Milky Way as part of the initial departure wave in 2185. See, part of me thinks that we've read this, but I, I can't uh, ever be sure because the exclamation point goes away. 
I don't think that we've done Ket Starships, though. Uh, the Ket utilize a variety of military aircraft, from agile dropships to enormous dreadnoughts. Closer inspection of Ket Starships, including several destroyed by the Scourge, has shown that they appear to be heavily biomimetic, while not organic. Uh, while not organic, the Ket have strong decision... Sorry, design inspiration from living organisms. Air filtration, electrical systems, and heat management mimic behavior seen in living creatures. The few Ket engine cores available for studies show that while the Ket use Element Zero cores, their design is radically different. While in comparatively short-range environments such as the Helios Cluster, they function similarly to Milky Way drives. Ket drive cores are capable of gravitationally contracting space in front of the ship and shortening it behind, creating an Alcubierre waveform that allows the ship to traverse longer distances quickly. Okay, that seems extremely complicated right there. Uh, it's almost like um, somewhat principal to... Uh, oh, what was that movie? I can't remember, but basically they talked about folding space and how it exists in two places at once. Or this kind of shortened space in front of it. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the distance, the design feature compensates somewhat for the lack of long-range mass relay transport in Andromeda, though these drives are highly inefficient by comparison. However, it is clear we have only seen a small cross-section of Ket starships, likely military vessels on long deployments. More scientifically advanced starships may exist elsewhere, and Event Horizon was the movie I was trying to think of. Yeah, I don't know if we've covered these or not, unfortunately. Uh, the tip is just equipped for long-range survey and scientific studies, which are carried out at the ship's two main labs. The biolab is equipped to hydroponically grow both Milky Way and Andromeda plant life for research or consumption. The plants also clean the ship's air and generate a modest, modest amount of oxygen. Sealed observation chambers are set up to study small fauna, sequence genetic material, or simulate bacterial growth in carefully controlled conditions. All biomatter entering or leaving the lab is subjected to additional quarantine measures. The tech lab is used for engineering and technical studies, spectral analysis using laser apparatus, and for analyzing the capabilities of discovered technology. New minerals or metals can be subjected to additional resistance testing before being used in the Tempest Research Center. Because of the potential volatility of new materials, the tech lab is equipped with heavy radiation shielding and can be sealed off in an emergency. Okay, and the last one on the list... Ark Hyperion. Ark Hyperion serves as the main vessel for carrying human settlers bound for Andromeda. Named after a Greek mythological figure associated with knowledge of celestial bodies, the Hyperion represents a breakthrough in intergalactic travel. Substantial money and resources were devoted to its construction, all privately funded by Gene Garson and the Andromeda Initiative. Built to withstand the rigors of nearly 2.5 million light year voyage, the Hyperion is outfitted with Odyssey Drive core technology which allows the ship to make a 600-year voyage safely at FTL speeds. It features enough stasis pods to accommodate approximately 20,000 settlers and crew. Ark Hyperion left the Milky Way in 2185 as part of the initial wave of departures under the command of Captain Nozomi Dunn. Okay, technology. Exploration tools. None of these are checked, but this whole thing was checked when we got here. So I'm going to go ahead and cover them all. Because I don't think we've covered these. Uh, planetary surveying, especially for potential settlements, involves meticulously scanning. However, this has been this has been little pressure. There has been little pressure to improve planetary scanners. In its search for a better solution for its pathfinders, the Andromeda Initiative began with hardware salvage from Geth platforms and software developed by the Solarian STG. Uh, with artificial intelligence support, initiative scientists developed a fast, accurate sampling system codenamed Panoptis, linking it to the quantum computing power of an AI, which can produce multiple analysis and predictive models in seconds. They created an omni-tool mounted scanner that completes accurate surveys in moments instead of weeks. For typical scanning, the Panoptis system uses a transmitted accelerator mass spectrometer, TRAMS, this creates a snapshot of an object's components, atomic weight, and radioactivity, and allows me to produce a more in-depth analysis. 
For biological materials, the Panoptis system switches to an electrospray ionization system so plants or animals can be scanned without causing radiation damage. I feel like we read the field of repurposing. Well, maybe I'm thinking of something different. Uh, with limited cargo space aboard the ARCs for specialized gear, the facing and facing unknown dangers in Andromeda, the initiative's philosophy is adapt to succeed. Colonists are required to have a wide variety of skills, equipment, and weapons are expected to perform multiple functions. However, this adaptability is fueled by non-renewable resources like ammunition, metagel, and power cells. Knowing they would not be readily available in Andromeda, in an emergency, the initiative's omnitools can recover and repurpose appropriate resources to serve a similar function. Liquid coolant allows weapon heat sinks to be reused, organic compounds can be re refined in a metagel, and so on. When these resources are available, the user is alerted via an interface between the user's scanner and their HUD. Okay, jump jets. Once a proprietary hardware for Turian Special Forces, initiative armor comes with jump jets as standard. These jets allow a user to make extremely high jumps or hover for several seconds. All colonists are trained in their operation to evade predators or environmental hazards, obtain resources, or conduct maintenance in high places safely. The jump jet itself consists of a helium-3 microthruster with a tungsten hafnium carbide casing. A gyroscopic element zero core functions to both keep the user oriented in flight and lower their mass when hovering. Keeping fuel expenditure down, hard-coated safety features prevent continuous operation of jump jets to avoid injuring the user or melting their equipment. That's good. While Andromeda Initiative gear and weaponry is designed to be as versatile as possible, extraordinary circumstances sometimes arise. Pathfinders and scout forces often turn to less orthodox resources to ensure they survive hostile conditions. Adrenaline is nicknamed for a prototype Omnigel OSD package. While deployed, it bypasses Omnitool safeties to manufacture small-scale manufacture, new heat sinks, and provide a temporary but powerful boost to armor. A shield capacitor immediately overclocks the user's shields, bringing them to full power and giving them a boost. This boost is unstable, however, and will be lost the next time the shield is breached. A life support pack boosts the environmental management system of a user's hard suit, enabling them to cope with environmental hazards for a long period. Spatial ammunition packs apply a, apply a variety of effects to weapons fire. Incendiary ammo costs projectiles, coats projectiles in thermite paste as they are fired. The paste adheres to and burns through armor. Cryo ammo uses Bose Einstein condensate to freeze an enemy or slow them. Disruptor ammo projectiles carry an electrical charge that damages enemy hard suit systems. The Cobra RPG package uses a volatile solution of Omnigel to manufacture a short lived but extremely dangerous projectile. Launched from an Omni tool, it hits with the same explosive power as a portable rocket launcher. Okay, Omni tools. Omni tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and manufacturing fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omnitool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor from a distance. The holographic haptic interface also functions as a communications device. With sufficient Omnigel or other raw materials, usually converted from salvaged light alloys, plastics, or ceramics, an Omnitool's fabrication module can flash forward small three-dimensional objects or emergency suit patches. This allows quick repairs or modifications in the field. The Andromeda Initiative's Omni tools are designed for reliability and efficient recycling of materials. Pathfinder's Omni tools take design inspiration from the models used by Solarian Intelligence Services, prioritizing the computer microframe to allow lag free scanning and AI support. Research and development. Okay, materials. Uh, crafting new weapons, armor, and equipment requires a variety of materials. Though there are strange new isotopes and ores in Andromeda, our scientists have identified familiar elements. Heavy metals such as iron, cadmium, and nickel are used in construction and heavy manufacturing. Their density makes them useful for armor components and ammunition blocks. Many light metals, including silicone, beryllium, magnesium, and aluminum, are resistant to corrosion and invaluable for computer components, heat sinks, and high conductive electrical wiring, while lithium has been engineering has both engineering and medical applications. Titanium, a transition metal, is eagerly sought after for starship construction. Vanadium improves steel quality and is used by the aerospace industry. Noble metals, including platinum, copper, and iridium, are rare and valuable in the Milky Way. They are often used in high-quality electronics or machine parts that require high precision. 
Minerals are graphite, used to manufacture carbon nanotubes and carbon fiber, and fluorite for high-precision scientific lenses are more commonly but equally useful. The initiative pays well for more hazardous materials. Uranium is used in weaponry and nuclear-powered facilities, while Element Zero has applications in multiple fields. Heavy industry, starship, engine, starship engines, jump jet components, and even as an ingredient in many advanced medicines, to name but a few. Okay, weapons and armor mods. Andromeda initiative equipment is designed to be modular and adaptive to any situation. Weapons and armor, in particular, are built with the understanding that they will be customized multiple times in the field over their operational lifetime. Gun modifications can be purchased from appropriate locations or recovered in the field. Each weapon's targeting computer also contains an adaptive integration VI that analyzes a mod on installation. Adjust the weapon's balance, heatsink requirements, and ammunition block accordingly, and sends a list of any additional components to the user's Omni tool for manufacturing. The process typically only the process typically takes only a few minutes. Augmentations. While many material components in Andromeda are familiar, we have also discovered a rare and more valuable materials attributable to exposure to the Scourge or mysterious alien technology. These quote-unquote augmentation materials are used in research and development to craft powerful specialized items. Augmentations are essential to support weapon or gear combinations that would be impossible to build with conventional materials. Some augmentations are sold by traders, but the highest quality augmentations require careful research. Once complete, the augmentation's profile is used to recognize additional examples of that augmentation out in the field. And finally, the research center. A research center is a, re a research center is a research and development platform normally assigned to outposts and some select initiative starships. Advanced manufacturing capability, small scale manufacture, and information processing allows the research center to develop new technology and build it almost on the spot. Build it almost on the spot, rather. They are also used to build powerful augmentations that enhance the capability of equipment. Given the initiative's current limitations, bandwidth and resource allocation to research centers is carefully monitored. The Nexus underlines the importance of new discoveries by rewarding scans and information gathered via a points system. Commonly referred to as research data points, this can be used to access time at research centers to discover or create new blueprints. Okay, that's kind of how they explain away the whole scanning for research points thing. Settling Helios. Okay, I'm going to assume we did these already. Okay, forward stations. Automated forward stations are part of the initial wave of exploration or colonist deployment. They contain valuable resource caches for explorers to resupply, repair stations for vehicles, and ground penetrating sensors to identify mineral deposits. Their presence improves the chances of a planet being considered viable. Damn it. <laughs> when a planet is seriously considered for settlement or a survey is ongoing, forward stations are seeded into orbital orbit via automated barges. Once summoned to a designated zone, forward stations descend and anchor themselves to the ground, becoming valuable landmarks. Most scout rovers have forward station connectivity, allowing them to be summoned to the stations. Current resource constraints mean that, in theory, only Pathfinders have official sanction to call down forward stations. In reality, reports show that enterprising colonists or unscrupulous scavengers have been known to hack the signals to raid the stations for supplies. Well, that's not cool. Okay, mining. Uh, without a steady supply of minerals and metallic ores, the initiative's engineering capabilities grind to a halt. With plans so far off schedule, it's even more important to gather resources wherever possible. On the ground, Pathfinder scanners and the ground-penetrating radar of forward stations assist in locating resources for immediate harvest or for colonists beginning their own mining operations. In space, initiative starships can pinpoint resources from orbit. Each ship is equipped with probes that contain both a sensor beacon and robotics drone that can harvest at least a percentage of any deposits quickly. The Nexus has relied on asteroid mining for the, ro for the raw materials to support the construction efforts, which yield heavy metals and platinums. Platinum. The Scourge is a rich source of Element Zero, but the hazardous condition destroys most robotic telepresence, making it an expensive pursuit. Most prospectors look on nearby planets for jettison rock and debris from the Scourge, which often contain EZO deposits. Okay, terraforming. Terraforming is the science of making planets more viable for life. Soft terraforming involves the introduction of bacteria or ocean algae to bind toxic gases or adjust a hostile ecology. Hard terraforming is often con 
abducted on arid planets with a thin atmosphere, using the impact of a comet or asteroid to warm the planet before introducing microbial life. This process can take centuries. Terraforming even a barren planet often involves significant financial and ethical hurdles. The Andromeda Initiative has the capability for terraforming if necessary, but is limited by the timeframes involved. The Golden Worlds surveyed from the Milky Way were intended to support quick colonist deployments, with second-tier candidates identified for potential terraforming later. If the remnant vault on EOS is intended for terraforming, as evidence shows, its function is unprecedented. The ability to affect change on a global scale in such a short time defines our under defies our understanding of planetary science. And lastly, cryogenic stasis. For many species, early long-range exploration relied on cryogenic stasis. Without modern FTL capability or long-distance transit methods like mass relays, the distances involved in space travel meant that, that most crews would die of old age before reaching their destination. Cryogenic stasis gradually lowers the body's temperature enough to slow its vital functions, but not low enough for damaging ice crystals to form, before the pod generates a mass effect stasis field that suspends both the individual and the interior environment in the pod. Contrary to depictions in popular media, the individual is not conscious of time passing. From most travelers' perspectives, perspectives they lie down in the pod only to be awoken moments later. Stasis failure, while regrettably common for early expeditions, has been vastly improved over the years. Even in the event of catastrophic system failure, multiple monitoring VIs and fail safes are in place to initiate an emergency wake up. You don't want a uh, passenger situation. Uh, okay, so that'll go and end us on this one. Um, and uh, we'll pick this up uh, soonish, probably another five to ten episodes or so. I'll do another one of these. And I know that we're probably covering stuff we've already covered before. I apologize for that if it's too redundant. Um, I don't really know of a way to other than my memory to to stop that from happening. It's hard to rely on the uh, exclamation points, but especially if the this thing scrolls past basically six entries. Um, I just kind of trust that the ones lower than this are all exclamation points, but I really have no way of knowing. Uh, but anyways, guys, uh, enough of my excuses. Uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. I know you have a choice in where you watch your Mass Effect Let's Plays, and I thank you for choosing One Night Sniper. Peace out, everyone.